Is that yours or? Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, it's all his. We're going to keep things moving right along. Right now, we want to bring up a uh, very funny guy, this man, <laughs> the myth, the legend, <laughs> Justin Dembski. Wow. Hey, uh, who wants to Hi, how's everybody doing tonight? I don't already know. I think it's going to be a uh, Yeah, keep doing that. That's good. Cool. How you all doing tonight? That's good, thanks. My name's Justin, and I hate my name. I hate my name because I'm 33 years old, and when I was a kid, nobody was named Justin. Now it's a real popular name. You got guys like Justin Timberlake and stuff like that. One of our video guys at work, his name is Justin Irish. He, he's not quite understanding, I'm sure, why I hate my name. When I was... Uh, when I was Justin's age, Justin just turned 21 over there, I was about 25. People were still walking up to me with the stupid fucking jokes that you always hear. Just in time. Nothing like having a 25-year-old guy walk up to you and tell you a joke you heard in third grade exactly the same way. And then you got these people that walk up and they try to change the joke a little bit, try to make it a little different. It's just in time for dinner. Like that changes the whole freaking joke. Although I heard one really clever one that I did like. They said, just in the wind. I thought that was kind of cute. So, I have a weird name. I wasn't real happy with my name. But at least I don't have my grandmother's name. My grandmother's name is Ingeborg Burlack. Imagine growing up with a name like Ingeborg Burlack. If you can imagine what kind of woman would look, what a woman would look like with a name like Ingeborg Burlack, that's pretty much what she looked like. So she was really crazy, she was nuts, she didn't handle things well, and so she made my mother crazy. And my mother, in turn, made me crazy. My mom used to tell a whole lot of stories. When I was a kid, you know, I was growing up and I was just bringing girls home for the first time and stuff. Mom always had a little routine she would go through. First thing she would do is she would talk about when I was a real little kid, when I was like three years old. She sat there, she said, you know, he was, uh, <clears throat> he was three years old and he was a big baby. He was a very large baby. And he was also too lazy to talk. He didn't want to talk. So one day I was at the supermarket, and there he was, pointing at something he wanted, going blah, 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 blah. And my mom said, no, you say what you say what you want. Tell me what you want. And I just sat there, blah, 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 blah. So then she hit me, and then a lady walked by. She's like, oh, look at that. That's horrible, beating on that poor retarded child like that. <laughs> I was like, oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> it's great to grow up with that kind of idea in your head. The other thing my mom would tell people, I guess I should start this out a little differently. This is another one of those things my mom would tell you know, my girlfriend when I would bring over a girlfriend for the first time. When I was a little kid, this wasn't a story she would tell, but you know, I gotta start with this story. When I was a little kid, when I was like maybe one years old, I was in the crib, and my mom hears some noise or something in the middle of the night, and she comes running downstairs to see what's going on, and I'm in my crib, and apparently I've gotten into my diaper, and I've discovered that shit is fun to play with. <laughs> So I'm sitting there and I've got shit all over me, shit all over the crib and everything like that. And my mom decides to run off. She grabs a camera. She comes back and she goes, good, Justin, good, Justin, jump up and down. I'm going, yeah, 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 jumping up and down all happy and shit. And then she takes the picture. And that's the picture that she would show <laughs> girls that I would bring over for the first time. My mom was a sweetheart. When I was just growing up, my dad left when I was barely born, so, you know, I was growing up, and once I got old enough to realize I'm supposed to have a father, everybody else has a father, I don't have one. Went up to her, I asked her, I said, Mom, where's Dad? And she said, your dad ran off with a topless masseuse. And, you know, when I was a kid, I thought, okay, well, you know, and as I was growing up, I said, that, that might be real, that might be true. And then later on in life, I asked Dad, you know, I asked Mom about stuff that, you know, Dad, where did Dad used to work and everything. And then my mom told me that dad sells dildos door to door. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Answering your fucking door and some guy's there. Hey, would you like to try a sample of our incredible dildos? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to introduce you to my dad. <laughs> None of that was true. That was a story my mom told. When I, was, uh, when I was in third grade, you know, my parents were separated. My mom decided she wanted to go on vacation, so I had to take a week off from school. So I took a week off from school, and then when we came back, I had to go back to school in third grade, and I asked mom, I said, what do you want me to tell the teachers? What should I tell the teacher about why I'm gone? This is my mom's response. Tell the teacher you have worms. 
I'm in third grade, I don't even know what the fuck worms are. I'm walking around in school, the teacher thinks I'm all freaky and weird and all kinds of gross and crass. All the other kids, you know, oh, Justin's got worms. They go and they tell their mom and then their mom explains to them what it is. So I'm the only kid in school who has the things apparently and doesn't know what the fuck they are. So as a result of, you know, all this kind of treatment from my mom, I grew up being a really weird kid. I, I had a whole different take on that whole fucking tooth fairy thing. Like, uh, you know, I was a little kid and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, look, let me get this straight. I lose a tooth, I stick it under my pillow, and in the middle of the night, a freaky idiot breaks into my fucking house and leaves a quarter underneath my pillow. It's like, that's kind of odd. <laughs> I was about it too, because, uh, you know, I was like, you know, I'm getting quarters and shit like that. So all the way up until, you know, all my teeth were gone, I was like, okay, <laughs> getting quarters. And then one day, of course, being the little capitalist that I was, I started thinking, I said, shit, if I can get a quarter for a tooth, what do you think I could get for, say, a finger? <laughs> So, you know, mom comes in one night, looks under the pillow, ah! Mom, it's okay! It's not mine! <laughs> she wasn't real thrilled with that. Another one of those traumatizing things my mom did when I was a kid. I was like 13, 14 years old, you know, about the age when you really first start really getting into chicks. So I come home one evening, mom's standing in the doorway, and she's staring in the middle of the street. We lived in a, in a row home in Philadelphia. And uh, she's staring in the middle of the street, and I'm like, what the hell is she staring at? And I look, and there's a dead cat in the middle of the street, been run over by a vehicle a couple times. And I get up to her, and she's like, Justin, could you pick that dead cat up out of the street for me? And I'm like, why? <laughs> so we have an argument for a while, eventually, of course, I give in, and I, mom hands me a pair of rubber gloves, a trash bag, and I go down, and I go to pick up the dead cat, and four really hot chicks come walking down the street at that moment. And I'm thinking, this is great. Nothing says sexy like a guy with a trash bag in one hand and a dead cat in the other. <laughs> it was about the only pussy I was going to get for a long time. I don't know. I was uh, about that age also. I was just getting synthesizers and stuff. I've been playing piano since I was three years old. I finally got a synthesizer, so I set up like a whole little recording studio in the basement and everything. And uh, mom was in this, on the second floor watching TV. I'm down there making music and everything, and all I hear all of a sudden over everything is, Justin! So I turn everything down and listen, I hear, Justin! Me. What? Her. Justin! What? So, Justin, would you come up here? Why? Just, just, just come up. So after a while, I'm like, okay, and I start going up the steps. Why? Just come upstairs. Why? Just come upstairs. I finally get upstairs, and this is probably a really good time to mention that this was before remote controls came out for television sets. <laughs> I was a remote control. Could you change that channel for me? I'm just sitting there thinking, lazy bitch. So I guess I should explain. My mom had me really, really young. And while that basically doesn't seem to mean much, what it means to me is that I'm going to have to deal with her for the rest of my fucking life. So I'll be like 70, she'll be 80, do the math. And eventually all this stuff, you know, everything I was going through, eventually mom drove me to drugs. So every Tuesday and Thursday we'd hop at the Ford Fairlane 500. Tuesday was crack night, Thursday was methamphetamine night. <laughs> my mom wasn't the only weird person in my family though. I also had a, I had a weird uncle, an Uncle Jimmy. He was a really weird guy, but he was also in the Vietnam War, which, you know, will make you a really weird guy. So one day he decides he's going to tell me this story. He wants to tell me a war story. So I'm like, okay. He takes me aside one Sunday dinner and he says, Justin, there I was. I was in the jungle. I'd never been in the jungle in my life. Most of the guys that were with me had never been in the jungle in their lives. And then I started moving forward through the jungle and my buddy grabs hold of me and he goes, hold on, Jimmy. I think I see Charlie up in the trees. And I looked and I saw him. And I said, Charlie, get your ass out of that tree. You're going to get a shot and shit, man. <laughs> Uh, that usually goes over better. <laughs> Had another weird uncle, he was one of those guys, you know. He, he was one of those guys who thought his shit didn't stink, and that didn't bother me too much. What bothered me were the other kids sitting around going, I think it does too. Uh. You know, they say that the nut doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> Man, when this nut fell off the family tree, this nut rolled 3,000 miles away to Vegas to get away from it all. When I moved out here, I moved to the Points apartment complex. Anybody here familiar with the Points? Right over there, right down the street. Down the street from the Points apartment complex was the library, and in between the library and the Points apartment complex was Monte Vista Hospital, which, if you're not familiar with it, is where they put all the crazy people. 
So I'm walking to the library one day, I'm walking by Monte Vista Hospital, and on the other side of the wall, all I hear are all these guys going, 13, 13, 13. I'm wondering what the hell's going on, so I keep walking, and then as I look, there's a brick taken out of the wall down the way, so I decide, cool, now I'm gonna look through it and see what the hell's going on. So I go to take a peek, and all of a sudden this fucking hand comes through, pokes me right in the eye, and all of a sudden all I hear is, 14, 14, 14. So I work, uh, after a while I got a job, pretty good job out here. I work on a uh, show in town. I'm a spotlight operator. I work over at the Shinta. Has anybody seen that show? Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> well, the Shintas is a family show. There are two brothers and a sister, and then there's a drummer. And uh, they're from Buffalo, New York. They came here from Buffalo, New York. And every night, Frank would do, do the show the same way. And towards the end of the show, he would do a little homage to his father, who was a uh, firefighter in Buffalo, New York. So he'd put the picture of his father up on the wall and Frank would point at the picture and he'd be talking about civil servants, police officers, paramedics and everything. And he'd say, like our father, saving lives for 30 years as a Buffalo firefighter. Eventually we got this new guy on the crew and we're all on ClearCom talking to each other and Frank goes into his spiel one night and he's like, and like our father, saving lives for 30 years as a Buffalo firefighter. And the new guy's like, Jesus, you know, I hear him say the same shit every fucking night. And I said, dude, you got to have some fucking respect, man. Imagine being a 60-year-old man and chasing a flaming buffalo down with a bucket of water. You know? <laughs> it's not that easy. Where we work is uh, the showroom is attached to a restaurant. It's funny, you know, how you know sometimes you get a song in your head and you can't get it out. And you just walk around and you start singing it. So I'm walking through and this guy goes, this guy doesn't see me yet, and he's like, oh, I wish I was an Oscar Mayer. And then he saw me, and he just couldn't help but finish the song. Wiener. One of the waitresses were talking to me, and you know, I was making a bunch of really crass jokes, shit like, hey, what's green and melts in your mouth? A leper's dick. So, oh, uh, yeah, well, they were that kind of jokes, and she, she was like, man, you should come down here more often, because the things you say makes me look like Mother Teresa. And I said, I'm sorry to make you look like a dead old lady. <laughs> Wasn't my intention. In the break room, there was a buddy of mine named Richie, he was sitting there, and uh, Richie was talking to a bouncer, and they were talking about their kids, and Richie was like, yeah, man, I love my son. I love my son. I wouldn't trade him for the world. And I said, well, Richie, you know, you'd have to, man, because if God came to you, and he said, hey, Richie, it's either your son or the world, and you said, my son, where would you live? My buddy Dave thought that was pretty funny. He came up to me, he was like, man, that was really clever. That was really, really smart. You know, you're one of the smartest people I know. I said, Dave, come on, man. The only reason that you think that I'm so smart is because you don't know anything at all. He took that well. Dave decided uh, he was gonna get into massage. He's going to school for it and everything like that. And he was real worried about it. He was like, you know, you know, what's gonna happen one night, you know, when I'm giving this really hot chick a massage and everything like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm a single guy, but I'm loyal to my girlfriend. What do I do if this hot chick turns around and looks at me and says, well, are you going to finish me off? I said, Dave, pick up a rock hitter in the head and steal her fucking wallet, man. <laughs> he thought that was kind of funny. So the other day, my mom came out, came out to Vegas. And I was talking to her, and she said one of those things that, you know, I think every mother says to her son at one point or another. She said, you're just like your father. You're just like your father. And that pretty much pissed me off, so I put on my clothes, I left the bedroom, and that's the last I've seen of her, so... <laughs> So that's going to be it for tonight. I'm going to make that my time. I don't know who's next, but I'm just going to let you know. Have a good evening, folks. Thank you very much.